My uh, presentation that I plan to give today is really looking at the tobacco end game, intellectual property, human rights and sustainable development. Uh, and in particular, um, the presentation kind of considers um, some of the environmental challenges posed by smoking and tobacco, uh, but it also kind of thinks about some of the intersections between intellectual property and sustainable development um, in, in that context. Um, so as you heard before, I kind of specialise in intellectual property innovation law, been working on tobacco control and IP and public health for some time. Um, as is always the case, I'd like to acknowledge the Turbo and the Yugara as First Nations owners of the lands where QT now stands. Uh, you know, in that context, you know, a real key priority in terms of Australia's national tobacco strategy is reducing smoking rates um, amongst Indigenous communities. One of the interesting elements of the debate over the recognition of an Indigenous voice was that an Indigenous voice would help to ensure that there'd be uh, better Indigenous-led health outcomes. And it's kind of unfortunate the Indigenous voice fell by the wayside, uh, but nonetheless, I think there's still a very strong focus in relation to healthcare about the importance of Indigenous-led public health interventions. And I guess it's also very important to acknowledge as well that Indigenous leaders have often been behind the push for tobacco control law, law reform. So the New Zealand Maori Party were very influential in pushing for plain packaging of tobacco products in New Zealand. Um, and in Australia, there have been a number of kind of Indigenous leaders who have been very keen on implementing effective tobacco control measures. Now, um, this particular presentation that I'm giving now is really part of a larger body of work that we've been doing on intellectual property and the sustainable development goals. So I've been the lead editor of this collection, the Elgar Companion on Intellectual Property and the Sustainable Development Goals. I've been um, ably assisted by um, my colleagues and compatriots, um, Professor Bija Amani from um, Kingston University in Canada, uh, Professor Caroline Newcomb from um, the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, the collection cuts across all the sustainable development goals and looks for connections to intellectual property topics. So instead of taking a very minimalist view that um, intellectual property just relates to the goal looking at innovation and that's the only one that is relevant to sustainable development, we took a much more open-ended view and argued that really all the goals had important um, connections uh, to intellectual property. Uh, as part of that, I guess we had an array of papers looking at the goal relating to healthcare. I did this paper on tobacco control. Uh, George Contras, who we is speaking later today, did a paper on gene patents. Um, we had another paper looking at access to essential medicines. We had an array of other papers that also kind of picked up health-related issues, um, including my colleague, um, Dr. Abbas, who had a, a final chapter looking at the impact of the COVID crisis on achieving the sustainable development goals. So as part of that work, I, I really kind of um, tilted at some of the past literature on intellectual property and sustainable development which tended to fall into a certain set of genres. There was a certain kind of genre of work that was very focused on technology transfer. There was a genre of work that was looking at access to essential medicines. There was a kind of a genre of work really focused upon access to knowledge. Um, and I found it kind of perplexing that tobacco control was often not even mentioned in some of the, the big studies that have been done of intellectual property and sustainable development. I thought that was a strange and peculiar oversight because really over the, the past decade, um, some of the major um, decisions in relation to intellectual property have revolved around questions of tobacco control. So Australia's High Court of Australia decision on plain packaging of tobacco products, um, investor state dispute settlement 
uh, matters between Philip Morris and Uruguay and Australia. Um, in the World Trade Organization, Australia successfully um, beat a number of challenges defending the validity of its plain packaging regime. Uh, you know, those thousand page plus decisions in the World Trade Organization perhaps give us the most insight into the uh, TRIPS agreement. So I guess the key kind of argument in my paper is that really we need tobacco control front and centre in considerations about intellectual property um, and tobacco control. And I guess it's kind of um, also worth noting that, you know, as well as relating to questions around health and well-being, um, tobacco control also has kind of connections to other sustainable development goals, including ending poverty, ending inequality, strengthening gender equality, facilitating decent work, promoting responsible uh, production and consumption, um, protecting life below water and on land. You know, not only does uh, smoking pose certain challenges in terms of public health, it also presents many environmental um, challenges. Um, so, so as a researcher who's worked both across healthcare and the environment, I was kind of quite interested in terms of how can we kind of conceptualise some of those ill environmental impacts of smoking. And the World Health Organization has also been trying to encapsulate some of these challenges. So Rudiger Kretsch said the environmental impacts of tobacco uh, using uh, adds unnecessary pressure to our planet's already scarce resources and fragile ecosystems. This is especially dangerous for developing countries, as that's where most of the tobacco production happens. Every cigarette you smoke, you're literally burning resources where they are already scarce, burning resources where our very existence uh, depends upon. Uh, so my longer paper kind of provides a little bit of a kind of an, an opening overview on the World Health Organization uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which we've already heard about, explores some of the tensions between intellectual property and tobacco control, looks at um, some of the tensions between sustainable uh, development goals and um, the global uh, tobacco epidemic. And I think kind of raises new questions around litigation over greenwashing um, by big tobacco. Um, we've already kind of heard a really good um, contextual overview of the World Health Organization Framework Convention, um, conferences of the parties, um, how that agreement is implemented at a national level a little bit about some of the guidelines and how that informs the uh, approach um, to questions around tobacco control. I'd just kind of like to kind of add to uh, that excellent kind of overview by noting that the key instrumental figure uh, behind both modern conceptions of sustainable development and the creation and development of the institution of the World Health Organization is Grow Harlem Brundtland. So there's kind of quite, in, in a kind of individual figure, there's quite a strong connection in terms of thinking about sustainable development and tobacco control. Uh, Brundtland um, is notable for serving as, you know, Minister of the Environment in Norway and Prime Minister of Norway. Um, she was a kind of an early advocate for tobacco control um, as Prime Minister in Norway. Um, she was always very kind of concerned about the impact of smoking and tobacco use and consumption on the developing world. She said, this is a global health challenge. It's also a cultural challenge. Um, she said, uh, you know, people continue smoking the way, the way that they do by 2020. Tobacco will be the leading cause of death and disability. So she was very kind of prescient in recognising the threat of global a global tobacco epidemic. And there's certainly kind of elements of that in terms of her early 1987 Brundtland report. There's quite a bit of discussion about intellectual property and the importance of public health um, in the context of sustainable development. Um, she kind of then kind of played a very kind of key role in establishing the World Health Organization and really ensuring that it was a formidable 
um, respected um, institution. Um, she pushed for the development of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. She was very concerned about the efforts of Big Tobacco to forestall um, the development of the Tobacco Treaty and to delay the introduction of regulation. Um, um, and I guess that's kind of an important context in terms of considering um, how the Framework Convention um, has been established and how it tries to not only protect public health, but also protect the environment. So where does intellectual property come into this mix? Well, um, the tobacco companies have been long aware that there have been various efforts to expand tobacco control measures, and they've often tried to rely upon um, various different legal disciplines to challenge those public health measures. So we kind of have internal memos going back to the 1990s in which um, Big Tobacco have hired consultants kind of outlying um, ways and means in which they could um, block or delay public health measures. One of those areas that they really focused on was intellectual property rights. Another was investor state dispute settlement. And a further area was um, trade. Um, clauses. Um, in terms of intellectual property, um, the tobacco companies really relied upon um, trademarks, um, registered trademarks, uh, but also on a variety of secondary regimes like copyright, designs, they even had some patents. Um, in the High Court of Australia, Four of the world's largest tobacco companies kind of argued that the Commonwealth government had engaged in a uh, acquisition of property, um, particularly relating to their bundled intellectual property, trademarks, copyright, patents, designs around the packaging of, of the um, boxes. Um, the Commonwealth government kind of argued that that was not the case. They had particularly designed the plain packaging regime to preserve the validity of trademarks and other forms of intellectual property in terms of the design of the legislation. Um, I was kind of an eyewitness to the High Court case. Uh, the majority of the High Court was of the view that there was not an acquisition of property. Uh, first of all, the court, um, Justice Kiefer in particular, kind of emphasised that there was a long history of public health interventions in terms of labelling and regulation. Um, for food, which we'll kind of hear about later, and nutrition for pharmaceutical drugs, um, but also in relation to tobacco control. So Her Honour really said you have to kind of look at the historical context. It's often been the case that governments have tried to regulate information. Secondly, um, the court was of the view that you know, intellectual property rights in and of themselves um, did not kind of entitle the rights holders to ignore um, government regulations. So they kind of emphasised, particularly Justice French, that you know, intellectual property rights were limited rights in many different ways. Um, they were designed to serve a larger public uh, purpose. They were not absolute private rights. Uh, there was a need to kind of think about the larger public health implications um, of the topic. Third, the High Court of Australia said there hadn't been an acquisition of property um, by the government um, in terms of the, the precedents. Um, and finally, the High Court said that they didn't have to think about other factual scenarios. So the tobacco industry had engaged in various slippery slope arguments um, they had said, what about alcohol? What about food? Um, one barrister even um, approached the bench kind of presenting rat sack and how that had been labelled. And the High Court of Australia said, you know, this particular case just relates to plain packaging of tobacco products. We don't need to make a ruling more generally about um, regulation in other fields and other contexts. Um, so interesting decision. Um, the tobacco companies were um, undaunted and kind of continued to dispute 
the regime through other means. So there was an investor state dispute settlement action brought against Australia um, by Philip Morris under an old investment agreement between Australia and Hong Kong. In the end, uh, that matter was um, rejected on procedural grounds that there had been an abusive process. Um, in other words, the, uh, Philip Morris had known that Australia was going to introduce plain packaging of tobacco products when it shifted its assets to Hong Kong to take advantage of the um, investment regime. Um, Uruguay also faced a challenge in relation to its graphic health warnings um, in relation to tobacco products. That was relevant to Australia because Australia's plain packaging regime piggybacks on the graphic health warnings regime. There was some initial concern about the quality of the legal representation of Uruguay in kind of facing um, this big action from Philip Morris under a, um, an investment agreement between Uruguay and Switzerland. Um, in the end, Bill Gates and Michael Bloomberg set up a kind of a, a litigation fund to help Uruguay and potentially other countries defend themselves against investment claims. So Uruguay fortunately kind of prevailed in that particular matter. Um, in the World Trade Organization, um, there were five or so countries who challenged Australia's um, plain packaging of tobacco products under the TRIPS agreement, the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement and the GATT agreement. Um, Australia by and large prevailed in that dispute. Um, Australia was able to show that there was a strong evidence base um, for the measures that were being introduced. In its arguments, Australia also kind of talked about um, the measures were important to promote sustainable development. So one of the defences, one of the arguments made by Australia was that the, the measures would be useful to promote sustainable development. Um, you know, Australia were able to show that the um, measures were, were largely in compliance with the TRIPS agreement, um, the technical barriers to trade agreement and the GATT agreement. Ukraine, who are one of the complainants, pulled out on what's the matter um, turned into old proceedings. Um, there was also an appeal by a couple of countries that Australia won. That's a really interesting kind of um, set of disputes over plain packaging of tobacco products. And as we've heard from our earlier speaker, a number of countries have been experimenting with tobacco end game policies. Um, I guess tobacco end game policies take on a number of different forms. Uh, I guess New Zealand under Jacinda Ardern's government had one of the more ambitious um, sets of proposals with uh, generational limits on smoking and spatial limits on smoking um, and strong prescriptions on um, the contents of tobacco. Um, but, you know, one would anticipate a number of different responses by the tobacco industry to the appearance of tobacco end game uh, policies. And as we've heard already in New Zealand, there's already been a backlash in which minor coalition conservative parties are now pushing for all those um, tobacco end game policies to be repealed. Um, Malaysia's effort um, to have generational uh, restrictions on smoking seems to have been sabotaged in the political process. But potentially you could also have challenges in terms of intellectual property rights, you could have challenges in relation to investment, you could have challenges in relation to trade. So you could have the next generation of uh, tobacco challenges um, in terms of those new measures that are coming along. In that context, I think it's really important to kind of um, highlight the importance of sustainable development and the role that tobacco control plays in that context, particularly in terms of goal number three. You know, goal number three um, has a particular target, looking at the implementation of the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, it also has a focus on reducing mortality from non-communicable diseases and promoting mental health. Um, there's a target looking at preventing and treating substance abuse. Um, but, you know, as the World Health Organization um, has said, um, goal number three on health um, has interconnections to the whole host of the other goals on the rainbow wheel of the Sustainable Development Goals.
I guess the World Health Organization has kind of been particularly concerned, not only about the health impacts, but some of the environmental impacts um, of smoking in terms of land clearing for tobacco agriculture and curing, water use, emissions from tobacco production. Um, in that context, I guess there's been quite a bit of debate of late about how can you deal with greenwashing um, by tobacco companies, sustainability washing in some circumstances. Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway wrote a very famous book about the merchants of doubt and the big tobacco playbook of trying to cast doubt on the scientific evidence behind um, the health impacts of smoking, amongst other things. Um, but I guess they were kind of very kind of concerned about companies trying to uh, pretend that they were healthy and sustainable when their practices were not. And I guess it's been kind of deeply concerning that many of the key companies like British American Tobacco, um, Philip Morris, um, Imperial Tobacco, and Japan Tobacco International have all kind of made claims in terms of their advertising and their public relations that they're clean and green and sustainable. Um, I guess this has been very problematic um, in terms of how we conceive of the sustainable development goals. Uh, I guess there's been a lot of concern that some companies are trying to hijack the sustainable development goals for their own purposes. And that's certainly a deep concern with the um, tobacco uh, industry and kind of raises questions about how, how should we regulate some of those um, practices. Um, and I, I guess in terms of my kind of paper, I really make the case that, you know, there are um, actions in a whole wide range of fields at the moment over the problem of greenwashing and consumer law and corporations law, um, even under intellectual property law. And we should apply some of those strategies in relation to the tobacco companies. Um, British American Tobacco indeed tried to get a Australian government climate active trademark. Um, and that was only withdrawn after someone kind of lodged a kind of a complaint and, and a protest. Um, but, you know, given that we've got comprehensive prohibitions in relation to tobacco promotion and sponsorship, uh, perhaps we need to have some um, prohibitions in relation to sustainability claims being made um, by the um, tobacco industry. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, um, um, as Gro Harlan Brundtland has kind of noted, uh, you know, sustainable development goals are really me meant to um, set in place a people's agenda. And as part of that, tobacco control um, plays a really important uh, role in terms of protecting the lives of people and also kind of protecting the, the planet. Uh, but we also need to kind of stay on track in terms of uh, realising and achieving um, the sustainable uh, development goals. So I think I will leave it there and uh, shuffle on.